compute. Okay. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, welcome back uh, to the next class. This is uh, day 11. Um, so today we are going to do something a bit different. Uh, as I said in the mail, we are going to learn how to adapt uh, an observation taken with a filter graph. That it means uh, this uh, traditional, for example, Fabi Perot uh, based instrument uh, to use it with uh, Sarah and Desire. Uh, I think this is something useful because from the feedback when we started the um, limitations for the for the for the course, uh, we had that a lot of people were interested in using the Desire code on observation from SST CRISP or on also DST IBs. So the idea is that I wanted to show you how to do the, the, this transformation already when covered in CERN. Uh, so then it's going to be useful for, for the LT lines. So in case that you already have the data and you want to embed um, some of the LT lines that you take with uh, those instruments, then you cannot start already uh, doing this and doing inversions. Uh, but uh, after that, when, when we reach the, the desired uh, level, we will do the same or a similar process. Maybe we have additional steps uh, for, for observation of calcium 8542 that are the main candidates for using desire and have been the key lines for CRISP and also IBIS. Okay, so, so then uh, the first thing is that we are going to use real data. Uh, and this is, uh, was provided by Nancy and, and Luke. So it's SSD uh, CRISP data. And it's a quite sound observation taken at this center. Uh, this is a, a snapshot of the observation and I put it here in the continuum. Uh, so you can see that the quality of the data is really good. And I'm not going to enter in the details of the, the, the snapshot itself on, on the time on the observation and like that. It's just it's a generic observation that it usually has the properties of a um, filter graph observation. And we will go uh, through the steps that we usually need to apply for, for using it. But you can see that it's already a good, uh, good data set. So, and we are going to focus on the black square that I highlighted here. Uh, that is a region of uh, 300 times 300 pixels. So what we're going to do today is we're going to learn how to adapt the cube, the stock profiles that are provided uh, from an instrument like SST uh, CRISP. Uh, we are going to do the basic thing that uh, we have to do is uh, normalize the observation to the local continuum in our wavelength range of interest. Then we are going to calibrate the wavelength vector. This is something that we, we always do because uh, it's, it's difficult to get an absolute value in general. So even if the estimation provided by the observers is good, it's always safe to double check. So what I'm going to show you today uh, is something that I recommend you to try every time that you have an observation. Um, before going ahead, uh, I want to mention that there are always several ways of doing this. So you can choose uh, one or another. I will just show you one, but I, but I really recommend you to calibrate it. Uh, in the way that you do it is, it depends on, on you, but uh, you should do it because it's always good to know that the velocities that you are obtaining are, has a reference and, and, and people can understand that, that reference. Um, we need uh, an, a, un a uniform spectral sampling. So the wavelength vector will have needs to have a uniform spectral sampling, similar as with the optical depth uh, for CER and for desire. So I will show you how to do this. In general, this is not the case of a filter graph because you you select a very narrow wavelength region, and then you take um, the intensity or the stock profiles over a 2D field of view for this specific wavelength region, and then you pick another wavelength region. So in general, uh, people, uh, observers, uh, they want to go relatively fast and they want to cover several things at the same time, sometimes continuum, sometimes 
very narrow close to the line core. So in general, they don't scan with a uniform spectral sampling like you have, you have with a traditional long slit spectrograph. So, so then we have to do an additional step to, to adapt the, the data for, for cell and desire. And then after doing this, so all this calibration and preparing the, the cube, then I will just save it in, a, in the format required for running cell in parallel and we will run an inversion. Very simple, just to check that what we have done is consistent. Um, but today focus will be more on the first path than on inverting and, and trying to understand the, the results. Okay. And yes, and this is what we, we will do. Okay, so then let's start. Um, so you will have, you will have two folders inside the, day 11, uh, so I will put them later. But the idea is one will be SST data prepare. That is where we're going to prepare the data for inversion. And then the example where I will run the, the inversion that will be this one in parallel. So then let's start with SST data prepare. Here we have several things, but the important one is this script. So let's go to that one. And this is uh, prepare.pro. So then, <coughs> I, I wrote a lot of information so you can go uh, through it when, when you're running the program. So, but the first thing is just let's load the cube that I prepared. So then um, if we do this, so you have that, uh, we have the Stokes cube that is uh, X and Y. So 300 times 300 pixels. Then these are wavelength points and these are the four Stokes profiles. Okay, and then also the wavelength vector is provided. Okay, so then the first thing we want to do is to just plot our profile to check how it looks. And then this is what I'm going to do. So I'm going to plot wave and then the first pixel of the array for the full uh, wavelength uh, range. So this is what we have here. I plot, uh, plotted lines connecting the dots, but this is just for visualization. So the idea is that you only have um, intensity information where the dots are. Okay, so this, this is something different respect to the um, filter graph, sorry, uh, sorry uh, long slit spectrograph or, or the simulations I, we had that there was uniform wavelength points. So here you have only a few uh, wavelength points. But uh, the advantage of a filter graph is that uh, you have a 2D, very, very big 2D field of view for each wavelength point. So then let's plot uh, the stock vector for the X and Y full uh, snapshot. And therefore the first wavelength of the vector, that is this one, that is continue. And for the st uh, stock high, okay? So then it looks like this, okay? So, and the, the first thing that we notice is that uh, uh, range is in counts, so it goes from, from 100, 400 to 600 approximately. So then the first step that we need to do is to normalize to the continuing intensity. In this case, it's uh, relatively, well, it's very simple because as you saw before, the, the stock profile, so let me show you. It, it's reaching the continuum, so then this first wavelength point is the, the continuum. So then the only thing that we need to do is to compute the average value of this spectral point over the full field of view. And this is what I'm doing here. And then I'm just dividing the full stock spectrum by that continuum. So then if we do this and this, then you see that now the bar scale goes from 0 0.8 to 1.2, okay? And if we plot the same profile, then you will see that it's uh, it's between 0 0.3 and, and 1. This is what we, you would expect in these lines. Okay, so so far it's it's a very simple step. Um, I was talking with Vasily and he reminded me that this is so easy in the case of um, heliocentric angle equal one, that is this case, this is the center, so then mu is equal one. But if you have a uh, different heliocentric angle. Uh, he recommend. He said that we should um, renormalize this value to the value 
you have uh, at the continuum for the HSRA model for that heliocentric angle. Okay, so then you compute uh, the continuum uh, for the atmosphere at that angle and then you renormalize. Okay, Basilio, is this right? I, I don't see you. Yes, yes, that's okay. correct. Okay. okay, okay. So in this case, very simple, but if you have a, a off, off center of uh, um, observation, just be aware that the continuum is decreasing as you go to the limb. Okay. Um, so then step two, that here is where we are going to uh, spend more time. Uh, so the idea is that um, if you look at the wavelength vector, uh, it looks like it's a bit shifted because the line core should be around 6301.5. And you can see that it's a bit shifted. I, I mentioned that to Nancy, but I said it's fine because we are going to shift it anyway for, for fine tuning the calibration. So even in this case, it seems that it's a bit off, but even if they give you um, a wavelength vector that looks reasonable, I still recommend you to follow the steps that we are going to take now, just to be sure that you have a proper reference for, for your wavelength vector. Okay, so then <clears throat> the option that we are going to follow today is to compute the average quite some profile over the field of view. And then uh, we will adjust the wavelength vector until the inversion of that profile provides a velocity that is in agreement with the literature. In this case, we will go later to this publication that is Travins from 1981. And the idea is that they explain that when you have uh, average observation of a quite sun, um, the lines, they, they have a, a slight blue shift, uh, what they call convective blue shift, and they have some values depending on the spectral line. So, so it's, a, it's a reference that you can use to have an idea more or less to where each line should be if you have the average quite some profile. Okay, so we will go in detail later to that. But the idea is that it's just a way of saying, this is my reference, and then people can, can, can check uh, what you mean by that reference, and then they can compare with their, their, their way of calibrating the data. Um, another option could be using the solar atlas, so trying to match uh, as possible the, the, the observation with the atlas, or if you are lucky and you have telluric lines, then you can also use those telluric lines that they will not shift uh, due to solar motions, uh, so then you can use them as a your zero reference. But this is usually more, more common with a uh, long slit spectrograph where you have a uh, very broad wavelength uh, coverage. Okay, so then let's start. Um, the first thing that we're going to do is to compute the average intensity profile. Uh, I'm defined here as zero variable, and here is where we are going to store all the intensity profiles. So I'm doing a loop for all the X and Y pixels, and I'm just adding to this uh, variable all the intensity profiles. And when it finishes, I divide it by the number of pixels in X and the number, number of pixels in Y, so the total number, so then it's normalized. So if we do this, then go, and this is our average intensity profile. You can see that the continuum is exactly at one because we, we normalize the, the, so we obtain the, the continuum intensity from the average of this value, so then it makes sense. So then we have this one, and then um, what we are going to do now is first, before embedding the profile, we need to adapt the wavelength vector. If you remember, we always had it first in milli Armstrong, and second, it was always referred to the spectral line of interest. So in this case, we have to go to our lines file, and we are going to embed 6301. So this is index five. I copy here, uh, I copied here the, the information we have in the lines file. And this is the wavelength that we have. So then the, the wavelength vector that we need for the inversion is the original one. Respect to the one, the, the line of interest that we are going to use. And then we multiply this by 1000 to have it in milliamps. Okay. So then, 
this axis, now it looks like this, okay? So, so this is the axis, so I mean the format that we need for Ser. But again, you can see that it's, it's off respect to the, to, the, to the iron line. So then um, we, we need to um, prepare it for inverting, but we already can assume that it's around 500 milliamps on off. So then I'm just creating, uh, I'm just shifting a bit the, um, the wavelength vector. So then now it looks more or less okay. So, so the average intensity profile is around zero. Okay, but we need to fine tune this. So then what we are going to do is to continue preparing the, um, uh, what I put here. Yes, ah, yes. And what we are going to do now is to embed this profile. Okay, but as I said before, usually with um, uh, filter graph instruments, the wavelength vector is not uniform. So then let's plot the wavelength vector and it looks like this. Okay, so from the first wavelength position to the last one is not a straight line, it's changing. So then the difference between spectral points is not uniform. So then we need to uh, interpolate to a uniform wavelength grid, both the, the, the wavelength vector and the Stokes profiles. Okay, um, so then uh, let us start with a wavelength vector that has a 10 milliamps on step that is usually a very good sampling. And then we define the number of wavelength points the new vector will have, and it's simply the last wavelength point or wavelength uh, value of the original vector, uh, minus the original one, uh, divided by the sampling, um, plus one. Okay, so then um, our new vector will be um, just um, a vector of increasing numbers multiplied by the spectral sampling plus the original value. And then just check if I do this. So the old vector had this initial wavelength point and this was the final wavelength point. And the new vector has this initial wavelength point and this last wavelength point. And you can see that if we print them, they are exactly the same. So the only difference is that now the new vector has much more points uh, and they are uniformly uh, uh, spaced. Okay, so now we have the new wavelength vector and now we can interpolate the average intensity profile using the old wavelength vector and the new one and we use spline to make it a bit smoother. And then if we plot, um, the all wavelength vector and the average intensity profile in this case are squares and the, yes, sorry. In this case are the squares. And then we overplot over that the new wavelength vector with interpol interpolated intensity in red color, then it looks like this. Okay, so it seems that it's working. So the, the interpolation of the wavelength vector and the, the average intensity, it looks good. Uh, but the problem is that it looks nice, but we didn't have during the observation, the information between those points. So we cannot assume that it's like this or another way. So then what we are going to do now is we're going to keep the same vector, but we are going to tell Ser and in the future design that the points that are not exactly the squares uh, should not be considered during the inversion. So it's like given zero weight during the inversion. So the code will never uh, take them into account when computing the, the chi-square. So then in that sense, we are like cheating the, the code, just saying that it's uniform, it looks very nice, but please only focus on the positions where we have the squares, that is the actual observation, okay? So then for doing that, we are going to create a mask. Um, let's do it, uh, let's see how, how we do it. So we have 14 wavelength positions. So then we run a loop for, for those 14 wavelength positions. And for each wavelength positions, we are going to compute the minimum of the difference between the original wavelength vector and the interpolated one, okay? And where that happens, 
in the spectral, the spectral position where that happens, we are going to make the mask equal one, okay? So then the idea is that the, the mask will be zero everywhere, except where we have the squares, where, and in that case, it will be one. And then we are going to uh, apply, so we are going to um, take the average interpolated intensity profile, and we are going to say, hey, where it's not equal one, make the intensity minus 10. Okay, so the intensity should be defined positive. So if SER finds an intensity that is negative, and in this case, minus 10, it's even very negative, uh, the code will just omit that value. We'll say, okay, something is wrong, so we are not consider that. And we're going to do the same for all the stocks profiles. So in, in, in the case of Q, U, and B, they could be uh, negative, but they cannot be larger than one because this is more than 100% uh, polarization. So if they are minus 10, then the code will say the same. Okay, these points are not um, feasible, so then we just omit them. Okay, so then let's see how it looks. So I'm going to plot now the new wavelength vector and the interpolated profile, but after applying the mask. Okay, so then let's do like this. Uh, okay. Okay, and it looks like this. Okay, it looks a bit ugly, but now I'm going to plot this again to just um, uh, show you what is happening here. But the idea is that to get a feeling, so you have that between zero and two, because this is the, the plot, uh, you have several points. It, it's 14 in total. And then you have a lot of points that are minus 10, okay? So then if I remove now the connection between points that this is done by IDL, and I just plot between zero and one, that is the next plot. This is what is uh, the, the new, in, uh, so the, the mask average intensity, average interpolated intensity, okay? So then it looks okay. And just as a final double check, uh, let's plot this new uh, interpolated uh, intensity in red, in crosses, and let's plot it over the original one, the average uh, intensity profile, that it will be squares, okay? So then this is how it looks. So we have that the new interpolated intensity after applying the mask, it's only uh, an intensity above minus 10, uh, in the spectral locations where the original um, intensity profile was different than, than zero. And in the rest of the points is minus 10. So then the code, the code will not pay any attention to those spectral uh, points, okay? So, so now, uh, even if we have made a long uh, way to reach this point, the only thing that we want to do is to invert the, the intensity profile. So then let's try to do it. And if you remember, we just need to uh, save a profiles file. Uh, that will be this one. Uh, we need to define an index. So the index will be the number of wavelength points that we defined before, an index five, because it's only the, the 6301 line. Then the new wavelength vector, uh, the average intensity interpolated and including the mask. And then for this calibration, we don't need the average Q, U and V. So then we just put zero, okay? And then we are going to do an inversion, very simple. So we will use a file model that is from the thing example of day two or something like that. And I just added a few values for magnetic field, velocity and, and the rest, I put it uh, normal. And then, um, and then we write it as an initial guess for the inversion, okay? Here I'm putting a, a warning, and is that you need to also define the wave grid file. And you have to, um, I hear there's a stop, so then, so your wavelength, so you have defined a new um, wavelength uh, vector, it was defined before, and the idea is that the wave grid uh, should go from the beginning of this wavelength vector, interpolated one, to the last point. So then it should be from minus 521 to 338. So then this is the, the values that we have here. And the sampling is the one that we define for when creating the, the vector and the index is five, okay? So this should be compatible with the rest of the things that we defined before. 
okay? And then we can run the inversion. I can show you that it's a very simple inversion. I put two cycles. I'm using the standard uh, values, so the lines, the abundance are the same. I'm just inverting stocks I. And I'm inverting a bit the, the temperature. So not only two nodes, I put up to five, but then I just focus on micro turbulence, uh, field strength, just for having it. And then velocity, that is, in this case, is important. If, it should be constant just to have an idea because if we have a constant uh, certification then we are obtaining the value that correspond to the height where the respondent function is maximum that it will be the line core so then because we are calibrating based on the convective blue shift of the line then it's better to have one node in velocity okay and then I also add micro turbulence because we are not including the spectral PSF in, the, in this observation. But, uh, but if you have it, maybe you can avoid using it, but at least I put it in this example. Okay, so then we run the, the inversion. I'm going to read the output profiles. Let's, let's run it. And then what I'm plotting here is, I, for simplicity, I computed the positions where the initial uh, profile is, is, is not minus 10. Okay, so I'm just plotting this position. So I'm plotting in, um, yeah, in squares, uh, the wavelength, the initial wavelength and initial profile. And then I'm plotting in, in red color, um, the output from the inversion. So the inversion is SI1 and I'm plotting it here. So then squares are the input and the red uh, profile, um, it's, um, it's uh, the result from the inversion, okay? So then you can see that it's a good inversion, I would say, uh, that there's a minor difference here, but in general, we are reproducing the shape of the profile. So then we can assume that this is a good uh, result. So then uh, we can read, the atmosphere that we get from the inversion. And then we can plot the velocity at any height because it's uh, constant. And if we divide it by uh, 100, we will have it in meters per second. Okay, so then I do this. And then it's saying that with the wavelength vector that we defined, this line is showing a, um, a convective blue shift of uh, minus 550 meters per second. Okay, so then at this point, what we now need to do is to check if this is inside the tables, more or less, or if we need to fine tune a bit the wavelength vector. So then we go to the publication that I put in the, um, in the Dropbox folder, you can, you can check it. So the idea is, uh, they explain that when you have uh, granulation, uh, you have convective cells that they have a larger area, and the intergranules, and they are moving in an opposite velocity. So in general, the number of pixels that are showing a blue shift motion, so they are moving up, it's larger than the ones that are showing uh, downflows. So then in general, you should expect that an average observation of a granulation, the profiles will be slightly blue shifted, simply because of, of, of that. So then you can go down and they, they have a plot that is not the best, but it's, it's okay for a statin. And the idea is you should look in this table that is, uh, you have to make some zoom. And then uh, this is wavelength, okay? So you look for 6301, that is this one. And then you need to look at the two last columns. So this is the um, existential potential. And this is the, the line depth. So if, if the line is really deep, then this number is larger. So then we have to go to this figure here and look for 3.65, uh, okay, here. And let's make it a bit smaller. So 365 would be something around here. And then they said that the size of the square is uh, proportional to that um, depth. So the larger the value, in this case it was 70, so it's a bit high. Uh, so the larger the value, the bigger the square, but it's not easy <laughs> to know which one. So 
I think there are big squares around here and maybe this one. So some some here, but I, I was thinking that around here there were more, more squares. So I said, okay, let's assume that it should be around minus 300 meters per second. Because now we have 550 that is around here and it may be off for this line. So I, I just assume that it's going to be around here. But the truth is that, yeah, it's, it's something that is not so easy from here. So maybe there's a better reference or, or you can use another method. But the idea is that if you do it this way and you put the, in the citation, people will understand more or less what you are doing. Okay, so then let's assume that this is 300. It's just for, for knowing what we need to do now. So then if we need to obtain minus 300, then we need to go back to line 140. Okay, then let's go here. 140 and we need to check to change this. We added 500 uh, milliamps from by I, but uh, now we can add, for example, this 505. Okay, then let's start from zero. Uh, there's a few stops, but I will go just over them just to uh, see what is happening. So then this is our new wavelength vector. Okay. Uh, this is the same as before, and um, now it's different, okay? So then um, this is interpolated one, so we are at which point? Okay, so then we are here. So this is the new one, sorry, this is the new one. And then it means that we are here. Um, here, so this is the last stop. I want to reach. Okay, so now we have change for checking the initial uh, value at, 100, at line 140. So we change the wavelength vector. And remember that here is an important warning. So if you change the wavelength vector, then you need to update the wave grid. Okay, so now our wave grid does not go in this range. We have to adapt with the values that we have here. Okay, so we, we added five, so then it's when 516 and then this is 343. Three. Okay, so now you are providing a wavelength vector in this profile.per file. So this is the profile, you're providing a wavelength vector here that is compatible with the one that we're, we're providing here. Otherwise it will, it will be a wrong, a wrong uh, uh, result. Okay, so now we are at this point and then the last step is to run the inversion the results, they look still okay. And the velocity, now it went a bit higher, okay? So then it means that we need to change the, the, the wavelength vector in another direction. And then this is something that you start repeating until you, you get a good result, okay? Uh, just maybe let's put like 495. Yes, saying something. Okay, and then I will do. Oh, sorry. Oh, what I did. Okay. Right end. If I right do this, end. will work. Okay. End. 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 E -N -E -N -D. No. Oh, again. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Nice. What was happening, Basilio? Why was uh, waiting? I don't know. I don't okay. Know what you, you, I, I, <laughs> I just you, wrote. You, okay. You want to run a program in the in the screen, not ah, not okay. the. Okay. Okay. So then, uh, just an example. I'm right. I'm almost arriving there. So. So then, this is the last one, and so we write here. Uh, now we went in the other direction. And then this is three, three, eight, okay? And then we just run the inversion. Um, okay, and I'm going in the other direction. Okay, it's just that I don't know what is happening because it should work, but uh, the idea is that now you need to play a bit um, with, the, with the reference. I'm just thinking because it should work, but 
Maybe I did something wrong. Okay, so just play with the values. I will check later why it's not working, but just play with the values until uh, you get a correction in this um, wavelength vector that is close to the value that you think you should have. Uh, and, and it should be, well, something that you can estimate from here or from the atlas, okay? So, so then when you have that, um, the next step is only to just repeat the same process, but for the full uh, cube, okay? So then, um, yeah, I, it worked for me for 505 million, so, so I need to check why. So I put it here, it should work, but I, I will check why and I will send you a mail later. But the idea is that when you have the wavelength vector, that is the one that you want to have as a reference, then uh, you just do the interpolation with this uh, new wavelength vector, uh, sorry, with this one, for the four stocks parameters, I, Q, U, and B, okay? And you do it for the full cube, okay? So in this case, what you are doing is doing the interpolation that we did for the average intensity profile, but now for all the Stokes parameters, okay? And, and then this can run and you will see that at the end, uh, just give me a bit of this. So then this is running until 300. And I'm going to just double check if I plot one uh, random, uh, randomly picked pixel at 50-50. Um, if, if it looks okay, the original one, original spectral sampling and original uh, wavelength vector with the original uh, intensity, if it looks the same as the one that we have interpolated, okay? And then is, this is this one, right? Yes, so this is color zero. Okay, so you can see if you pick any pixel, it, it looks like it's working. So then you can save the, um, the profiles. Uh, I commented the line because I already had the, the previous one that I think were properly calibrated, but I need to double check. Uh, but you can do it with your data. Then the only thing that you need, here, you, you need to do here is to save the fits file for running it in parallel. And again, I put here just as a double check, double check for the um, um, for the input files for the inversion in parallel that your wavelength grid should be like this. So this should be the initial one and the spectral sampling and the final one, if this is the correct one. So the, the one you have defined in line 140 is the one that you need to have in your wave uh, grid file, okay? So then, is there any question until this point or you want to see the inversion results and then we, we go back to the question? Carlos, <clears throat> uh, I have a question. Yes. So in this example, you have not considered at all the, the spectral instrumental profile, right? No, yeah, no. Um, okay, okay. Um, Okay, it's fine. Um, no, no, I mean, yeah, so I mean, if you have it, I think it probably, I mean, if you have it, you, should, you have to put it. Uh, and probably in that case, maybe the micro turbulence can be removed from as a free parameter. Uh, but I think it will not change too much the result, I think. Oh, yeah. okay. Because usually, I mean, for the, for the, I mean, most of the instrument have the, the instrumental uh, profile and for a fabric perot or a or a or for example for hmi you have the, the instrumental profile but in some cases these instrumental profiles are wavelength dependent and yes. so i don't know how that yes, has to be sorry yeah yeah go ahead no but i think the, the depends on dependence on wavelength i think is not so i mean it's related with the filter that you use so i mean let, let's go yes. back. So, so for determining the line core, I think the PSF will not change because the PSF is going to make your profile yeah. broader or, or, or narrower, but the line core should be in the same position. So for this yeah, yeah. calibration should be the same. And then for doing proper inversions, then definitely you need uh, a PSF. 
in the case of a filter graph, as they tune different wavelengths, yes, and they also exactly. use different filters, then That's the spectral I mean. PSF yeah. changes, and and you need to have one that models your your specific broad and, and narrow filter that you use. So so the idea is that both ser and desire they allow you to have wavelength dependent PSF. Okay. So okay, then, that was my question. <laughs> yes. yes. So, so in the future, when, when I show you, uh, when I will show an example of uh, an inversion of uh, calcium plus iron, that for example, this observation, they, they also observe calcium. So the idea is that we will do this calibration in separate waves. So each line will be calibrated as, as we are doing now. And then we will generate a PSF that uh, it will have index, for example, index five, and it will be the, PS, the PSF of this line. And then index, okay. I don't remember, the, the one for calcium, it will be the PSF that the instrument, that the, the observers give you for the calcium. And then you will have, you can embed them together and the, each uh, spectral region that is separated in the wave width file here will have also a, an independent PSF, okay? Okay, perfect, thank you. Yeah. 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 Okay. But this is something that is new. I, I think it's from two or three years ago when, when we started inverting with uh, with um, desired um, SST data, and we realized that that uh, each, yes. Um, each... I mean, Basilio hard code is a C version for HMI many years ago for me, yeah. and <laughs> to include the this uh, instrumental profile. So yes. that's yes. what I was asking. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. yes. And thank you, Basilio. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 So this, this is something that we will we will go through it and when when we go with this eye because yeah it's it's different. So the profile has different properties and, and the filter um, I mean the the past one filter that they use uh, is uh, is different. So then the spectral properties are, are change a bit. But this this will will be taken into account. Okay. Okay. So, thank you. Yeah. So, any additional question? Or I can go ahead. Okay. Okay. So then, um, let's assume that what I did was correct. So, in the in the previous example, I I did the computation. I don't know why it's not working now, but I did it with five hundred five. I will just check it. Uh, later and, and then I will put the, the I right think, file. Yeah, Carlos, I think it, it works, but the problem is that you write R new and return. Okay. And then the, the code was, IDL was expecting you introduce some sentences. Okay, let uh, me try. But if you, if you write R new and then the, the name of the, of the procedure is yes. working. Let me try. Uh, yes, I had too many stops. Um, so then, this and then this, this. Okay, so then the wave grid should be 516 and 343. Three. Then I save this and then I run the inversion and I print. Okay, it, this should be 300, but I don't know why. So, okay, uh, yeah, yeah I, I, so, see, I, see. I will check. I will check why. Um, mm -hmm. oh, let's try because. We have two minutes for that. So, in any case, you can always uh, calibrate using an atlas, for instance, yes. matching the atlas and then shifting the. Yeah, you when you do it, just remove the stops. Okay, <laughs> okay. So five hundred eleven and three four eight. So five hundred eleven and three four eight. Just to see if we are going in the right direction. Um, Okay, too much. Okay, so then it should be something between 505 and 510. So, so we can do it later. I, I will just fine tune it for this example. Mm -hmm. And then the example I will give you, you will have the correct one. But the idea is that the one that I got, I created a grid file compatible to that. I put it here. This is the one I had. And then I prepared, so just, just let me go back. So this is, I will also give you this folder. And this one is exactly the same as previous week. So we have the initialization, the master, then the run files. And then in those run files, we will have a configuration file. 
and the grid file. So this grid file is compatible with the one that I generated. Um, that is this one. And then for the configuration, as I just wanted to show you how the velocity it was was looking, if, if it was looking okay or not, I just run it one cycle. And then I put a lot of weights on stock sign because in here the polarization signals are not so high. So I just wanted to have an idea of the velocity. And then I embedded the temperature with a lot of freedom, so five nodes, but then one node in micro, magnetic field, velocity, and then, well, I put it one in gamma and phi, but probably you can, well, yeah, I don't know. But for this example, I just wanted to have a very, very, very quick uh, example of running and, and how the, the results look like. And I read the profile that we have just created. So look at this, name is the one that we have here at the end uh, this one okay so it's the output from the interpolation to a new wavelength uh, grid and the mask so then we embed those profiles uh, i just put uh, four initial atmospheres i didn't even put a threshold so just run the four because it, it's really fast um, and then the results are if you go to the file results, the folder results. This run to, I checked several, but this is the, the one I thought was okay. Uh, inside figures, you will see how I plotted them, but uh, just because it's same as last week, let's focus on the results. So I'm plotting, uh, well, let me see. I'm just reading the results. And in this uh, figure, I'm plotting wavelength zero and wavelength 44. This is the wavelength that has a minimum intensity, but in the new wavelength vector. So I, I check it and it's uh, position 44. And I am plotting in the lower panels, the same um, information, but for the inversion. Okay, so then this is the continuum intensity, this is line core intensity for the input or the observation and this is the inversion results so in general the with the with this configuration it's it's working well uh, there are some of course there's always some uh, grain or something around here but uh, we can say that for this test it's 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 good enough okay and then i'm making a second plot where i'm reading the atmosphere and also uh, I was reading the microtubules, but at the end, I think I'm not plotting it. I'm just plotting temperature, velocity, temperature, and, and field strength. Um, and the idea is that last week uh, we had the input atmosphere. So we are comparing the one we get with the one uh, we, we, have, we had for the synthesis of the profiles, but these are observations. So we don't have any more the a way of really checking if, uh, if our atmosphere is accurate or not. So you should assume that if the fits of the profiles are uh, okay, then the atmosphere should be also okay. So then let's see that result. Uh, then. So temperature looks okay, but there's something. So maybe uh, it's better to start with the maybe less freedom or have a few cycles more. So I would say that the temperature is not so good, but at least it's, it's okay. But for me, the important thing was to really double check if the calibration, the velocity calibration was reasonable. So what we have here is, I did the inversion again with one node and it's providing us the information more or less of um, yeah, continuing a bit higher. Uh, but the important thing is you have blue, that means uh, negative velocities or upflows in the granules. And then between the granules and intergranules, you have white, that is uh, zero. And then you have red, that is usually located where you have dark areas. So even if we are 100 meters seconds above or below of the, the, maybe the best calibration, the important thing is that you do this double check and you said, okay, if granules are moving up and intergranules moving down and between them it's zero, then it's it's reasonable to, to believe that your, your wavelength calibration is okay. 
or at least you can you can explain it and show it in this result so then people will will see if they if they understand what you did and if they agree okay i just added analytic field but as i said the the signals are not so high and i didn't put too much emphasis during the inversion of on obtain, obtaining the magnetic field so i i i'm not focused on this now i think if you if you want then you can play a bit with the inversion configuration adding more cycles and also more initial atmospheres just to see if this improves um, but the the goal today was how to get from the observation that you receive from someone or you, or you get if you go to the telescope to get it ready for run an inversion with uh, with sir okay so so before going to the summary is there any question did you follow more or less the process okay so maybe maybe, maybe yeah. it is uh, Im yeah. important to uh, um, point out that you need to do this reinterpolation and have a fine grid only when you have a, a PSF, right? Because otherwise all the wavelength points are basically independent. And mm -hmm. only when you have to convolve with the, the spectral PSF, you need to, to, to calculate all the fine points so that you yeah. can compare the proper broadened um, yeah. spectral points at, at, the, at the, the right wavelength positions. Yep. Yeah, because Otherwise, this is yeah. technically you don't need to do it. Um, yes, because this is done Basilio with F FTS or not? No. So, so, so I don't understand you. So why yeah. why we need uh, a uniform spectral sampling ah, for convolving for convolving with FFT? Yes, yes. The, we, are, we are convolving using FFT and then FFT. if you are using macro turbulence or a, a PSF or something that you need to 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 convolve, convolve. you will need yeah. a an uniform wavelength yes. grid. Yes. But uh, you always need or macro turbulence or a yes. PSF or something yes. like that. So then you are always convolving. Yes. 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 We are convolving. But okay. Of yeah. course, if you, you don't need to convolve, you can train yes. the wavelength independently. Yes, yes, yes. It's, it, it looks like a, it's a bit cumbersome, but the idea is that it only takes like five minutes when, when you have the program ready. Um, and it's something that you will do a lot if you analyze filter graph data. So, so yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's like it is. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so, so then um, let's go back to the presentation and then the homework I have is that again always try to run the test I prepared. I will I will just double check why the the velocity is not minus three hundred. I think I just missed one one point, but I I will just update it so then you can you can repeat it. Um, then play with the inversion configuration. Um, here I, I said be aware that you only have fourteen spectral points. So then this means that. Let me go back to um, the configuration file. So, so for example, in this case, I have uh, five nodes in temperature. So then it's five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. So we have 11 uh, degrees of freedom and we have 14 times four uh, spectral points. So in general, you should try to have uh, not as the same degrees of freedom as wavelength points, so a bit lower. So you can add gradients and other things, but just don't don't try too much because you only have one line and only fourteen spectral points. So so in this case, it's not like the spectrograph or like the synthetic data that we had four hundred points or even more and several lines. So for this test, just play a bit, but don't try to push it too much. The idea is that. Uh, people that use the filter graph, they usually observe two or three lines together. So then when we have the three lines, and even if each line has like 10 spectral points, that is much more information that the code will use for constraining properly the, the atmospheric parameters. So, so try to play a bit, but don't, don't get uh, too crazy because we only have 14 spectral points on, on, on one line. Okay. So then, um, Extra, yeah. So I would say that if you understand more or less the process and, and it works in your computer and you already have data, 
then you should try uh, with your data, try to calibrate it this way and, and check if it works and then try to run the inversion I, I prepared and check if the results are reasonable or, or start even playing with the inversion configuration. But the idea is that this can be done already on, on your data if you have it, okay? So yeah, and, and if, if you have any questions, because it's a complex process and, and I thought I went slow, but sometimes I go a bit fast. So if you have any questions, just uh, contact us or ask uh, them during the class. So yeah, yeah that's a question. That, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Carlos. Yeah, uh, uh, I still have a question about the convolution and the, um, uh, instrumental profile. So if I calibrate my data separately before I start inversion and uh, use, I don't know, maybe Atlas and I will convolve that uh, Atlas data with instrumental profile for calibration, then I guess I should not worry about, um, uh, about calibration in, in, the, in the inversion. Probably I don't need to run those procedures you you showed us uh, at the beginning, the initial procedures, right? I think so. So so if you have intensity and you match your profile with that of the atlas, it should be okay. Just maybe just for double check, you can try to run a very quick inversion of the of the average uh, intensity profile and just double check where the velocity is. But uh, yeah. yes, it, it should it should so it should be complementary. So if you follow that procedure, it should be the same as the one today. I think. Okay. Yeah, I think Basilio usually if, uh, do that. So he just uh, um, uses the, the atlas and, and convolve with the atlas. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, and then, uh, do I still need the uniform wavelength grid? Yes. If I okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. That, that's definitely for, for this eye answer. You always need that. It's, it's the same as with the optical death. Uh, it's because internally some things are done. And, and what Basilio was saying, so the, the convolution with either the micro turbulence, so I mean the, the PSF that you generate with a width that is defined as a micro turbulence or um, the spectral PSF, the, convol the convolution is done in a way that it's required to have uniform uh, spectral sampling. So then the mask should, uh, should be applied every time. So, so, I mean, you have to put uniform vector and then apply the mask where you give a non-realistic value for the points that are not from your observation. This is, uh, this is a requirement. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so additional questions? Okay, okay, so then what I was going to say is that in the next class, uh, I think it's the last one for, for the SER module, and we will compute in parallel uh, the response functions and, and we will check how to um, um, load them and how to compute them in, in parallel, maybe I'm still thinking if I will have time to check um, how to compute the chi-square <laughs> inside there. I hopefully I will have it. And if not, we just focus on this and, and we will finish the, um, the first module of, um, of CER. And then we can move to, to RH. Um, this uh, is the same as two weeks ago. So we are changing the parallel wrap and, and new versions are coming. As soon as I'm, I have a bug, I report it to Ricardo and then he sent me new one the day after that. So I will try to keep um, a version control, but uh, the, the examples of each week are usually using the, the, the most updated one. And so, but I, I will try to put in a separate folder, the, the, the best or the most updated uh, run. Um, yes, next class, uh, next Friday. So, um, Please let me know if there's any question uh, before I just stop sharing. So was it more or less okay, clear? Yeah. Okay, okay, so then I stop sharing and I ask again, no questions?
Okay. So then uh, see you next week. Yep. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you. See you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.